All right, um, we are recording and um, yeah, thanks for joining the Make Guitar podcast. It is the 28th of November as we're recording this. How are you doing, Mitch? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. Doing pretty well. Great. Yeah, what have you, you been doing this week? Anything exciting? Um, you know, just jamming, uh, jamming with friends. Uh, it was Thanksgiving this week, so um, I, I had a day off, and I, I did a little bit of uh, attempted recording. Um, and we'll talk more about that um, in, as our, our, our main subject of the day. But uh, yeah, um, it's a it's good, good week for playing guitar. Yeah. How about you? I think I'm doing okay. Yeah, I was off um, on Thursday and Friday for Thanksgiving, right? And then we had we had started the the, the song in a week challenge, and so so that gave me some extra time to work on that, you know. But I think I got my song done, you know. It's in the can, so to speak. That's good. Yeah, I didn't finish mine. It's uh, I I had some issues with uh, um, saving because I got to a certain point with a song that I, you know, like it was an old idea and, and then I moved on to it, the, the new idea. Cause that was really the goal to take a new song, a new, new idea for the week and, and take that over the finish line. But then I had an idea for a fork in that idea. So I, I did a save as, but I didn't save the original but, uh, version of, of Western mystery um before i started the new version so i lost some some work there which sucks um but i still had western mystery too yeah you know i've had some issues with garage band where like copy and pasting or duplicating files <clears throat> they like it saves the tracks that you record <clears throat> the stuff you record and it kind of hides it somewhere mm -hmm. and so when you copy it or you duplicate it <clears throat> it re references the original like tracks and that can be a problem like I've, I've lost some work that way not understanding how that works and it's kind of a mystery because they don't really show you the files so you're not right. exactly sure where a particular file went to or how it was stored or deleted you know right well i have a little bit of insight into that there was a time when um we were making i was uh, working with brendan on recording a bunch of uh, of songs that we were playing and um i had to open up the songs like um using uh what's that archive uh, utility and then you could see the the connected you know the the referenced uh audio files so i was able to resave uh, to resave them that way Oh, good. Good tip. Sounds yeah. a little technical. Now I'm, I'm, I'm always like just careful when I duplicate stuff or, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> if I save as, or I, I do a copy and paste, like I'm kind of careful about doing that, you know? Right. Yeah. That's the best way. You know, actually, now that I've said that I should go back into, um, into the, um, the file for Western mystery and see if I have the audio files yeah yeah that's kind of an issue it's not a big issue but it's just something to be careful of you know yeah well i think that's the main message is just be careful <laughs> if, you, <laughs> yeah, right. if you're putting your blood sweat and tears into a, a recording you should uh um be careful that you have saved it yeah take a deep breath measure yeah. twice <laughs> yeah 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 so anyway so just so people know we're, we we started a thing where we're going to try and record a song every week so the goal is just you got a week work on your song your song is done at the end of the week and yeah next week start a new song right and that's not all you have to do i mean you should also be working on your your body of work and you know like making incremental progress on your you know your master works but like having a new <laughs> song that you complete every week is is a good way to you know to exercise your mind into um feeding you more inspiration yeah, I think so, you know, so anyway, I, I kind of had an idea and I, I just put it down and, you know, it's kind of imperfect, but I think that's okay, mm -hmm. you know, but it's kind of complete, 
you know, I'm going to call it done, you know, I, and it was good practice. I, you know, I recorded a bunch of tracks. I re-recorded some of the tracks. I, I tinkered with the software drummer in, in garage band, which by the way, I think is pretty good. It so is pretty good. Yeah. It, it does work pretty well. Yeah. You know, and it's a little imperfect, but it's okay. You know, it's kind of working like working with a real drummer because they don't always play what you want them to, <laughs> to play anyway. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can sort of in, increase the, complexity of something that they do i guess that would be like working with a real drummer you could just say hey you can make you know amp up this sound or this part a little bit or whatever you know um go easy on the the snare in this part or whatever um but yeah you can't really control another musician yeah yeah so so i i just recorded um you know the guitar parts and I had, um, and I got the drummer kind of laid out where I had, you know, I kind of recorded some parts and then I copied and pasted them. And then I laid out the drummer to create a song structure. So I had like sort of an intro, uh, outro, and then I did like verse, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, outro kind of structure. You know what I mean? Yeah. I didn't do a bridge, you know, it was kind of easier not, I didn't, couldn't think of anything. So I, you know, it had to be done at the end of the week. So I, that's what I came up with. I think right. I did a double chorus at the end, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. I think that's a good way to do it. Yeah. It was kind of like a B, a B B structure, you know, maybe. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then after I copied and pasted the guitar parts, I just played them over all the way through. So I used the copy and paste to lay down the structure, you know, mm -hmm. and then and then I went back and played the parts again until I, I was kind of happy with it. And then I did another take and I to get the sound like I, I read this interview with Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols. And he said that essentially like on the Sex Pistols album, there's like 12 guitars. So, you know, so they, they multi-track the hell out of the guitar mm -hmm. track, which like, it's got a great guitar sound. Like it's yeah, that record. But you'd never know that it's 12 tracks. I wouldn't have guessed. No, you know, I would have just guessed one, but you know, maybe two, I don't know. But mm -hmm. um, he said there was 12 guitar tracks. I, I think I seem to remember. So I was like, well, if, if Steve Jones can do 12 guitar tracks, I can do like six or eight or nine. So <laughs> I think I recorded about nine tracks, but about six of them are basically the same thing. Just, you know, but what I did was I, I played three tracks, but I did one on each pickup. Mm, so I did cool. like the bridge, the middle and the neck pickup, you know, so they just sound a little bit, the tone is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. My guitar has an out of phase setting and I almost feel like I should have done one track with the out of phase setting just for fun. I didn't think about that though. And then I did another set of tracks with the Big Muff. So I, I kind of did another couple tracks where I, I plugged my Big Muff in through GarageBand. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I was having some issues where I thought the sound was really thin. Actually, I started out playing my Mustang, which also has a out of phase setting. Um, but I thought that the, you know, like the, the sound just going into GarageBand um, and using the GarageBand uh, pedals and amp simulator, it was sounding really thin. So I, I, I got this one, which has humbuckers out and um, it was better, but it's still like, I, I had a little bit of a hard time getting a, like a, a, a mighty sound out of the, out of the GarageBand pedals. Oh huh. yeah. You know, I, um, I don't like all the sounds in there. Some of them I like, but you know, I guess like some, they speak to some people, you know, they're sounds that people are looking for. So I usually go with the, with on the clean guitar section, I go with the clean studio stack, which like kind of, I, I think they, they, they kind of build that one as like a clean Marshall. Mm. So I go with that one. If I'm using a guitar pedal, into GarageBand. So I use a clean studio stack. And then for the other guitars, I think I used the, um, the studio drive. Let me go look actually, what was that one called there? The classic drive, which is like a Marshall, like a distorted Marshall sound, you know? Okay. 
So I use the classic drive. And then for the, when I plug the, the guitar pedal in, I use the um, clean studio stack because the guitar pedal is like super distorted anyway. Okay. Yeah. I think I use surfing in stereo and because, you know, I was doing a, a surf song yeah. um, and uh, I don't know, I think I need to kind of play around with, um, with some other things, but I might try, you know, plugging some actual pedals into it next time. Um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I think the sounds are pretty good. You do have to kind of pick and choose because there's a lot of sounds on there. I don't like, but there's so many to choose from that. I can usually find one that I like. Mm -hmm. you know um and then sometimes i gotta go in and, and tinker with the settings but not always usually it's pretty good like it's in the ballpark you know and i think all the sounds that are really built they're not like unique they're all built from the internal stuff so like when you choose like the clean you know studio stack it's like the particular amp setting with the other particular settings you know mm -hmm. Right. You know what I mean? And you, you could turn the knobs to get to get from one to the other if you wanted to. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I'd probably want to find a, a sound that's pretty similar to what I normally play with, um, which would be either a, like a box amp with, you know, a compressor and overdrive and a, like a slapback delay and kind of like a spring reverb sound or a Fender amp with kind of the same stuff. Yeah, they have all that stuff in there. Right. Right. So you just have to tinker with it. I, I'm not a fan of the guitar pedals in there that look like guitar pedals because they're just hard to, to work with because mm -hmm. they have little knobs that you have to click to turn, you know, like, <laughs> and then it has like a foot switch that you click to turn it on or off. And then it has an LED to tell you whether it's on or off. But yeah, it's just like on the computer, that's a hard interface to work with. If it was on the floor and I was doing it with my foot, it wouldn't be so bad, right? Right. But for some reason on the computer, it's harder for me to work with it that way. Right. Yeah, there's one, there's a wah pedal in there. And I was like, how are you going <laughs> to, how are you going to express yourself with a wah pedal on a computer screen? I know, right? It's hard to do, you know, yeah. right? Um, but yeah, so, so I set it up that way and then I just mix the guitar. So I recorded like, I don't know, six guitar tracks, just basically playing the same kind of main song all the way through beginning to end. And then I just mixed them until I, I kind of felt like I was getting a good sound, you know? But you've got some of each of those six tracks in the yeah. final mix. Okay. Yeah, right. Um, though at the end, I noticed that my the Big Muff sound, it's got so much gain going into GarageBand, like in, like in, real life i don't hear this as much but in garage band it picks up the subtlety and mm. like i could hear like my palm scraping on the strings and the pick like on the string you know? so there's like a little pick scrape noise on there and now it's kind of egregious to me like i feel like i should get rid of it but i didn't notice until i got to the final mix you know so so it, yeah so I, you know I, that's the, yeah i think that might be tough to get rid of in post, I think that's the kind of thing that you might actually have to, uh, you know, like relocate your right hand while you're recording that track. Yeah, yeah, I might have to just re-record that. I, I mean, like I said, that we just did this in a week, so you know, if I really, if I come back and feel the song really needs to be worked on some more, I'll do it. But for right now, I'm, I'm thinking about next week's song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like do you have that. an inspiration for next week's songs yet? No, I'm totally devoid, but I think I'll I'll be inspired any moment now. All right. Well, I like that Brendan said uh, you have to wait until next week to work on next week's song. Um, okay, fair. Um, <laughs> yeah, Brendan had his song going. He he recorded something too, so that's pretty good. So there's three of us, right? Yeah. Well, I helped him with his song. Yeah, I heard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I had to do the bass myself. I, <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't do bass on my own song yet. Yeah. Yeah, I recorded three bass tracks, but then I just used one of the bass tracks and then there's one lead guitar and then the rest is just like a bunch of rhythm guitar, but it's like all layered, you know. Hmm. But Did I think you it really use that? Help, helps like to switch the pickup around so you get like a slightly different sound for each of the tracks, you know. Yeah. Yeah, well, you, you, you kind of inspired me. I think the next time I want to try out, you know, mixing a out of phase sound and, you know, the Mustang. Uh, I don't really, I don't really solo the pick 
pickups on that. So I'll probably do one in phase and one out of phase. I won't do like a all bridge pickup and all neck pickup kind of sound because it's it's pretty noisy and they're like low output pickups. So um, yeah, just one in, one out. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think it's just good just to get a little bit of range of tone and, you know, when you record, you know, mm -hmm. so that was what I did. Um, and then I used the, uh, the arrangement track, you know, to set right. everything up. And that was like a big help, you know. I didn't know about that. Um, I've never used it. Um, oh, you, you should learn the arrangement track. The arrangement track is pretty good. You know, do you have GarageBand? Let's go do it right now. Yeah, yeah, I have GarageBand. Yeah, should I uh, start up? Uh, I'll start up a new uh, project. Yeah, yeah. Share your screen, right? Okay, I have to create the um, the track. Okay, so I'm going to create an empty project, and now I'm going to um, share my screen. And hopefully, this will work because this is the dialog box. Oh no, I'll go on this one and then I will go back to here oh, yeah, and I'm go. going to yeah. start out. Um, you can't see it, but I've got a dialogue box that says choose a track type. So I'm going to choose, um, I'll just choose a guitar. Yeah, I can or, see it. Yeah. Oh, you can? Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we've got this. Yeah, so go this to is the track the... menu and choose show arrangement track. Yeah, so the arrangement track is a little different from the other tracks, and it just lets you set like an area that can be bridge, chorus, verse, intro, outro. So click the, the plus button there and then add a track. So you see it says intro, and then click it again, and then it'll say... Verse. You know, yeah, and then do it again, right? And it should do chorus. Chorus. And bridge. Bridge, okay. Yeah, and click it again one more time for outro, right? And it does outro. Yeah. So that's yeah. a very simple song, but you can change these. Yeah. Right. So yeah. You can an... click on those and change them. We'll go, we'll do another verse. How about that? Yeah. Right. Oops. Verse. And then yeah. let's see what it'll do. What will it do? It that it did the chorus, just what I want. Nice. And I click it again and it does the bridge again. We'll just make that the outro. For yeah, now. right. So so this is really good because I like to get the song to hit three minutes. Right. It's kind of mm -hmm. like my timing. So it depends on your the BPM and other things. Right. So like it's hard to tell. But if I if I set the timeline up and I set it, I make it like about three minutes long, then I can divide these things up and kind of decide like how much I need. Do I need like eight bars of intro and then a bridge and maybe a double chorus at the end to complete, you know, and make it mm -hmm. about three minutes, you know? So I rearrange and you can grab the little space in between each of the, each of the arrangement track things. I was just oh, going to yeah, see yeah. Oh, we're at almost two minutes right now. Yeah, right. This. Yeah. So that could use a couple extra sections, right? So we can kind of tell now, but you can also grab the little space in between the, um, the sections and resize them. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. So I can, yeah, I could just make them longer. Yeah. Right. So what's cool here, this is the best part of this, right? Is once you arrange that and you've got your song kind of arranged, right. You know, and it's like kind of structured the way that you want it. You can, um, you can add a drum track, right. Yeah, you can't move those or rearrange them, I don't think, but you can resize them. It's okay. a little frustrating to put them in. So it's, you know, like if you just put them in kind of higgly piggly and then have to try and drag them around, it's that can be kind of busy work, mm -hmm. you know? So it's good to try and get this right the first time or close, you know? Right. Or what you could do is probably start with your, you know, your sketch, you know, your the concept for your song and then add the arrangement track in after you've done that. I would imagine yeah. that that would help you sort of figure out how long your bridge needs to be in your chorus and all that. Yeah, I, I would say, yeah, do that. But then if you can, if you can do it before you add the drums, because right. there's a cool little trick. If you add a new track, like add a drum track, like the software drummer, right? And then you'll see at the beginning it gives you like intro, verse, chorus, and it kind of changes up the beat for each of those sections. Yeah, you can see from the waveform. I I don't uh, I don't think I can get my audio into the 
into the, the Zoom call, but uh, yeah, uh, we'll have to work on that. Yeah, but but yeah can I can see, see the, it from the waveform. Yeah, right. And so that actually was really helpful. Like if you get the thing, the song laid out and then you lay down the software drummer, like it'll kind of change up the beat for you. And then you can change it again yourself, but it's kind of a nice way to start, you know, cause it changes, for, you know, it, it does the, the settings a little different. You can click on each one of those and see how it's set it up at the bottom, right? Oh so, yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, so that one, it's kind of like for the verse, it's kind of snare and, and bass drum. And then, you know, for the bridge, it's kind of like snare and drum, yeah. but it's like a little bit louder, you know? Right. Yeah, I definitely noticed when I, I was listening to one of these back and the um, the intro was very Tom heavy. Um, yeah. And then it switches into um, kind of a straightforward. Yeah, I think it does the symbols on the chorus, you know, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of adds. This. But, you know, you can always change that, too. But it's kind of cool that it kind of filled that in for you. It just did some of the some of your work for you, you know. Right. Yeah, I, I think that would make it a lot easier to play along to, you know, just, you know, having a drummer that anticipates the next part. Um, that's the big part of what makes jamming with a real drummer um, easier, easier or, you know, oh, yeah. more, you know, it's like if, if you play with a good drummer who knows that there's a, you know, like a a, a change into another part it, it helps you to to anticipate that and and make that transition oh yeah for sure right whereas yeah, playing with like it. a regular old drum machine it's just, it that that's not there so this yeah. is great yeah i love it when the drummer does that thing on the cymbal like psh, you're like okay <laughs> that's four bars and i i forgot to count you know or right. four measures or whatever it was right you know, but anyway, yeah, so so that's like a really great trick right there is like set up the arrangement track and then have it do the drums for you, you know. I think the right. software drummer is pretty good in GarageBand. It, he doesn't always play what I want to hear, but it's pretty good. Like you, the beats sound pretty natural and you can kind of have some control over it, you know. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in seeing how that goes with the arrangement track. You know, like if I can simplify or, you know, like we're these you know the simplicity slider will it affect all of the verses or just each one one at a time that's a good question i think it'll only do the ones that are selected okay so if you select them you can change them at the same time so i've i think i, I think that's how it works and i think i've run into that where you know like i changed one and then i realized like the other verse is not changed so then i have to copy and paste it or or you know oh right that's a good thing. option yeah. yeah. But anyway, yeah, that I think that's a good way to get started is do the like think about your song structure, you do it on paper, whatever, right? And then mm -hmm. and then lay out the arrangement track and put the drums down. And then you can kind of play into the drums. I usually play like one guitar part. I use that um the region, you know, that little yellow bar at the top. Mm -hmm. the and looper. then I'll record and if you have the region on, it'll just loop that region and you can do multiple takes. Right. So you can play an eight bar section and, and play it like eight times or 10 times and then pick one of the takes and then copy and paste it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I copy and paste and then later I'll add a second track and then I'll play the whole song through, right? So I can copy and paste to get the whole structure in and then and then I can just play the whole song through again until I get one single take that is is acceptable, you know? Yeah, yeah, I was amazed the first time I saw that, um, that uh, I don't know what's, what it's called, but that that kind of like recording selector that you could, you know, do multiple takes and then just copy the one. You could even take little bits of each one, right? Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes I'll I'll play the song if it's eight bars, like I'll play part A for eight bars and then part B. And then you can copy and paste and choose different takes. Right. Right. So that's it's just kind of a cool fast way to like like, you know, you know, hack the song together. And then, and then once you kind of have it kind of laid out on the timeline, then you can think like, okay, I'll play it straight through this way, or I'll add the bass track, you know? Right. Well, I remember Gino was showing me um, a, something he was doing in Logic and he would write a solo by playing solo a bunch of different times. And then he used parts of different performances and just like use the most interesting parts together. And he'd have a really, you know, like dynamic and interesting solo that's made up of multiple performances. 
Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's clever. Yeah, yeah I thought that was a really great trick. No, that's a great one. Yeah. I I remember reading an interview with I think it was Gilmore? Jason Becker. Oh. And he said that he was in the studio and he heard that uh um Malcolm Young, you know, the guy from ACDC mm -hmm. or Angus Young. It was Malcolm's the brother, right? Yeah, Angus he's the rhythm the lead. Yeah. Yeah. So they said like Angus, like he they he had heard from somebody else in the studio that like, you know, Angus plays multiple guitar solos and then the the producer takes two takes you know so he'll like slice together two takes you know and so jason becker he was kind of new he's kind of a young guy and he was like yeah you know if, if he if angus young can do it in two takes i have to do it in two takes you know like, you know uh, well you know i think you had told me that david gilmore he puts his so uh, his solos together out of multiple different performances so i think so yeah i he believe just, it. he just I, takes his best ideas and he doesn't do it in two takes yeah well he's he's the master so maybe that's the yeah. right way to do it you know i don't know i'm just lucky if i can just get one take that sounds okay right yeah but you could try you know doing multiple takes and then using different bits from each take okay on this week's song that's going to be the yeah that'll be the inspiration thing, right yeah yeah i don't know if you're aware too there's another thing in there like if you get this far right but there's another track if you go to the track menu and okay you i'm gonna choose, share my screen and you choose this one it's kind of like i'm not i'm still kind of figuring it out but if you go to the menu and choose show master track yeah that one yeah right okay so the master track is the mastering track so like click on it to select it. Yeah. And then do you see down at the bottom? Actually, yours is not quite looking right to me. Hmm. Let me see here. Yeah, yours doesn't quite look like the one I have, but let me see here. Let me go get the master track again here. Because, like, when I get it, it shows me a menu. Oh, no, you know, maybe click on one of the guitar tracks and then choose the master track. No? Hmm. Okay. Well, we might have to get back to you on this one. Well, see, like in the master track, it'll have a, it has a section that lets you add um, EQ so you can master the song. Like it's the whole, like it's the whole mix down oh right okay and then there's a section that lets you add compression and then there's like some other tools in there too it's this right? thing right so i have to you have to click on this little button to make the oh, uh, yeah maybe that's it yeah so then you want to have um let's see what if what, we wanted to put the uh eq bypass channel oh, that's not that not that eq no, you know, I'm trying to find it here. Like I, like I said, I'm kind of new to this, right? I just kind of dug into this, and it's like a total rabbit hole of stuff. Yeah, dude, I don't know where that went. Where did that thing go? I guess we're going to have to come back to that. All right. If anybody well, if, knows, tell us. Yeah, like, set yeah us let straight, us know. You know? Um, it'll be helping the whole community. Yeah, right. Because the master track has its own like master volume too. So you can set the volume of everything there. So if like if all your tracks are mixed, but it's still peaking at the end, you can pull the master track down. You know, I mean you could lower all the other tracks too, right? But you can also lower the master track. But I'm not seeing the option here because there's an option in there that shows you like you can turn on the the EQ and you can turn on the um compressor. And then there's like an exciter and then a noise gate. Or no, there's another comp a second compressor stage too. And a oh, later. okay. Right. Well, yeah, we, maybe we'll have, we'll have to do a special, uh, special edition on this one. Yeah, where is that thing in there now? Oh, well, we're not going to worry about it. We'll come back to it, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, I was tinkering with that and it was kind of good. I, I just don't know enough about the process, but it is kind of a place where you could learn and practice, right? So 
you know, I kind of tinkered with uh, mixing the tracks and then I went to the master track and I tinkered with the EQ. The EQ has a bunch of options in it. So you can choose one of the preset options. So there's like one that like emphasizes the drums. There's one that emphasizes like voice and acoustic guitar and stuff like that. So I, I kind of went in there and picked one that I thought sounded good for the music I was doing. And then it shows you like a graph with like a kind of an EQ curve, you know? Okay. And then you can grab different regions and kind of move, bump them up or down a little bit, you know? Oh, cool. Okay. I'm looking forward to diving into that. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of cool. And then I turned on the compressor, but I don't know too much about it. I mean, I know the, like the idea of compression. I know I have a couple of guitar compressors, but when it comes to this kind of mixing, I'm not sure exactly what I'm looking for there or what I'm listening for. So, you know, I tinkered with it until I thought it sounded okay. You know, the, again, they have under the compressor, they have some preset options and then there's like some sliders that you can adjust. So you can pick an option from the presets and then you can adjust the sliders. And, you know, I just kind of, you know, kind of tinkered with it just a little bit. I didn't want to do anything too um, drastic because I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm timid. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's a good, it's a good thing to experiment around with because yeah. I mean, nobody's, you know, nobody's watching. Um, you can you can do whatever you want. It's just play around with it and see what yeah. see what uh, see what works. Yeah, I don't know if this is right, but and I had a discussion with Brendan about this a little bit. But I I listened to the tracks like when I was mixing. I was doing it mostly on headphones, but then the last couple of days, like yesterday and today, I I listened through the speakers. And I have a mm -hmm. couple cheap like studio monitors, you know. They're like they were like a hundred bucks or something, you know. So they're they're not expensive, but they're not, you know, totally cheap. They're ac they're actual monitors, right? So I have them plugged in to my mixer, and then GarageBand goes out through the audio interface to the mixer, right? Mm -hmm. So then, to, so the last couple of days, I was listening through the through the monitors, right, instead of the headphones, right? Brendan kind of was like, well, you know, most people are listening to music through headphones today, anyway, so maybe headphones is the better place to do the mix. Yeah. I mean, it could be, you know, um, Prince, um, he always had a very, very broad sound. Um, and people said it was because he was kind of mastering for the Walkman because people were wearing those, those cheap little headphones and that's how they were listening to his music. So, you know, like that, that heavy, deep bass and those, you know, that, you know, those, uh, very punchy but kind of percussive i don't know how to say this but it sounds like a wood block in yeah. a way the drums and then his guitar is very wiry so it sounded great on a walkman i had one of those walkmans with the orange fuzzy phone mm -hmm. headphones those are it was great man I yeah i still had it <laughs> yeah i am uh I seem to remember a story. I want to say it was like the Rolling Stones, but I'm not sure. Somebody from the 60s and they were like, yeah, we were mixing this album. And then the the producer was like, come on, let's get in the car. And they all went in the car and listened to it. And the idea was that if it doesn't sound good in the car, like people aren't going to like it because they're mm -hmm. going to be listening to it on the radio in their vehicle. And you know, so they were like, yeah, let's go listen to this in the car, you know? Yeah, no, you got to do it. People listen to the radio in the car a lot. Um yeah i know like dwight yoakam has a he has some fancy corvette with a like a really high-end <laughs> stereo and he just like drives around fast listening to the music super loud you know and if you're lucky enough to be the passenger while he's <laughs> doing that <laughs> that's cracking me up like i'm i'm gonna be that guy i'm gonna just listen to my music in my prius <laughs> really <Yeah. loud. laughs> and driving around <laughs> Well, if it sounds good in the Prius, you know, you're, you're going to, the, you know, there are a lot of people with the same setup, you know, yeah. Prius with the stock, stock, uh, sound system. Yeah. Well, you know, the Prius we have the, the, one of the things that sold me on the Prius was that it has an aux input. So it's like in the console, if you open up the console, it's got a little eighth inch jack and you can plug an aux cable in there, you know? And, and so I was like, oh, great. You know, I can plug my iPad or my iPhone in there and listen to music but there's something about it like that the input is really low hmm. so like you need either like a 
like a preamp between your phone and the aux input, or you got to crank the volume on your stereo up way higher than it would normally be. Oh, wow. That's kind I of think annoying. it was like a little bit of a disappointment that they didn't do it right, you know, or not in a way like, I mean, like, I don't know what they're expecting. Like people are going to plug in something other than their phone into this thing. Right. You right. Know? So, so anyway, that was, that was kind of a, a little bit of a disappointment with the Prius. So I, I, the, at first I was sold on the aux input. I was like, every car should have one of these, you know? Yeah. Yeah, they should. Yeah. I mean, I guess they have USB on, on a lot of cars now, so you can interface with your, your devices that way. Oh, you could charge your phone. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. 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 My car is maybe older than that though, you know, <laughs> than the USB. Right. How about, does it have Bluetooth? Bluetooth is not no. very good audio quality, but that's how, you know, a lot of it gets done these days. Oh, is it really? I didn't know the audio was not good on Bluetooth. Um, I, I, I'm not an expert on this. I'm not a, like a professional audiophile, but um, I've heard people say that audio quality is not the best on, on Bluetooth. Yeah. I feel like to tell you the truth, I feel like we're going backwards. I feel like, you know, when I was younger, everybody had like a home stereo system that was pretty serious. Like it, yeah. it, was, it was like kind of a point of pride to have some big speakers and a nice, you know, stereo system. Right. And nowadays nobody has that. Right. And, you know, like nowadays you're listening to, to music on your headphones or you're on your computer. And now we have those, like, like those, um, like I have a JBL thing. It's just like a plastic thing that sits on the, on the table. It's kind of a mm -hmm. cylinder, you know, and it actually sounds pretty good. Like the quality's good, but it's Bluetooth. So like, you know, you can't really connect to it any other way. So you got to use lower quality audio through the Bluetooth, through this thing that sits on your kitchen table, you know? Right. Yeah, you're right. I mean, in, in the seventies, like people had those, you know, those big, heavy speakers with, you know, with a direct cable, you know, uh, speaker yeah. cable connecting it to their amplifier and um, yeah, music sounded great in the seventies. I know, I know. What what is wrong with people today? They they don't know what they're missing, right? You know, we have a thing that's like a it's like an amplifier, like a stereo amplifier, and you can, it can power your speakers, right? But it's um it's Bluetooth, so you can, or actually maybe it's Wi-Fi. I forget. I forget if it's Wi-Fi or if it's Bluetooth, but you can basically interface with it over the airwaves, you know. And it's kind of like it's kind of like your stereo, but instead of having like a turntable and a cassette deck in it, it's just like, you know, it's on the Wi-Fi network, you know. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it's the you know it's convenient to be able to you know to share the DJ duties. You can just say, oh, listen to this song that I found on on YouTube or Spotify or whatever. Um, not that we use Spotify, but. Um, Uh, yeah, a, a friend of mine gave me this uh, this Black Star Mini. I think it's called a Fly Three um, mm -hmm. amp. And one thing that's really great about it is that it has it has Bluetooth, so I can take uh, my phone using uh, music memos and just feed it, or I can use uh, like a, a drum app and feed it into the Bluetooth, and then I can just play along with it on the guitar because this is of course a guitar amp and it has oh, built-in delay and oh, that's great EQ. So you can mix the drums and the and the instrument on yeah. the same speaker oh that's great yeah or you could use music memos and play back your little you know like little ideas and just play over them using the um the the black star your big ideas yeah yes yeah, your big ideas take your big ideas that you recorded in in music memos and yeah over right them next week's idea yeah okay. yeah <laughs> uh, yeah so for anybody who doesn't know music memos is this amazing app that apple used to um offer and every time i open it up now it says you should export your um it doesn't didn't say it this time but it it, it would say like music memos is being replaced by voice memos yeah and you yeah. should export all your ideas onto something else. Um, but voice memos doesn't do this. Like, so I'm just going to open up one of my ideas. Um, this is going to be, you know, embarrassing. But so, so here it is. This is one of my ideas. 
Okay, so then it's just playing back my song, but it's got this button here so I can turn on the bass and I can have a drummer. Nice. So there you go. It, you get an idea of what your song is going to sound like, even with, you know, yeah, just one I track. I haven't played with that. I liked music memos a lot. And then it didn't really like bother me that they moved to voice memos because I haven't really explored it so much. Well, the, the functionality of music memos um, is not like you can't put a drummer in a uh, automatic oh, bass player on your um, also voice memos doesn't show what chord you're playing. Uh, oh, yeah. Let me open this up. Okay, so this is what I didn't show. Like if you click on it, it shows you the note, the score. Oh, so oh yeah, I can't, I can't see it. I can just it's too bright. Uh yeah, I can't I can't uh I can't yeah. make it. I know what you're talking about though, because it shows the like the it tries to guess what the chords are and it's pretty close a lot of times. Mm -hmm. It's not always right, but it's it's kind of nice because you could kind of like if you played something, you could just look at it and jot down the chords, you know. Right. So if you don't have music memos, you probably can't get it, but you can find um some apps that duplicate the um the functionality of music memos there are um sorry i'm <laughs> i did something to my okay sorry i i did something to my my zoom window so it was frozen um but there are apps that have the same functionality um, I don't have any recommendations. I haven't tried them, but um, yeah. Google it. Yeah. Yeah. Or hey, duck, so duck, uh, go it. let me ask you this too. So, are you working on any projects this week? Um, I didn't. I didn't uh, move forward with any projects this week. It was pretty much, uh, you know, it was it was Thanksgiving week, and uh, I did some jamming and recording, and um, and that's about about it. Um, but yeah, how about you? Did you do any any new projects? Yeah, I got a couple things done. Let me show you. Uh, you got a lot done this week. Yeah, so I, I finished this this Euro rack drum machine. I need Ooh, to get wow. some knobs for it. Yeah, right? you need knobs. But it's got these like three circuit boards. <laughs> this is like a That's crazy impressive. epic build. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's and it's almost working. Like I got it, like it it all works, but like for some reason the snare drum like is not sounding right, which is kind of too bad because snare drums like super important, right? But mm -hmm. the other drums all work and they sound pretty good. Not amazing. They, they sound like like drum machine, you know, like like old school drum machine because it's kind of like this was based on like a Roland DR-110 or something. Mm -hmm. But it's actually the clap sounds amazing. You know, it's and actually that this the, the hi-hat sounds pretty good too. The snare though is not quite right. I gotta, I did something, I don't know what, I gotta figure out what it is. For some reason, like the snare has like two sounds or like a drum sound followed by kind of a, like a noise decay. Mm -hmm. So you get, it kind of sounds like the little rattler at the bottom of the snare, you know? Right. Right. And I feel like I'm just hearing that and not the actual snare sound, right? So something is wrong with the snare drum. The bass drum sounds okay too. Um, but anyway, I got this all working, so that was kind of fun. Um, and I got it all uh, tested mostly, right? I had run into a problem, like it wasn't working at first, and then I took it apart again and, and figured out what my problem was. The, the, it had these electrolytic caps, so they're really tall, but when I sandwich all the boards together, the, I don't know if you can quite see it there, but like, yeah, so there's like a cap like right here, the little black thing, you can mm -hmm. see it just, fits between the two boards but some of these were this tall and they were running into the traces like where the parts come through the bottom side so it was shorting out right because like, the top of the cap is like aluminum so it, like so it was kind of shorting out on the on the circuit board above you know so anyway so i took it apart and then i replaced those caps and bent them over so they're not doing that anymore and then it started working, except for the snare drum. So I'm going to take it apart again and see if I can get the snare drum working correctly. 
but it was kind of a fun project. So I, I got that done. And then um, what did I do? I built this. Um, I finished up this thing. This is uh, like a 1981 DRV clone, you know, so it came out pretty good. I, I had a bunch of these um, jacks with the LED ring. So there's like this ring kind of lights up, you know, mm -hmm. and when I, I drilled this, I actually drilled a hole here for the LED, right? And then I later, after I'd done that, I was like, well, I think I'm going to use one of these jacks with the ring because I have a bunch of these and I want to get rid of them. I don't really like these. Why not? <laughs> I don't know. They're, I don't know. They're just kind of weird, you know, like, okay. I don't know. I just, I, I thought I might like them. And then I bought like five of them and then I used a couple and I, meh, I didn't really like them. Okay. I, think I just like the regular led, but anyway, I had this extra hole here. So I, I had a bunch of these Allen bolts. I just took an Allen bolt. and screwed Oh, okay. I thought it was a rivet or something like that, but yeah, that's a good idea. It's kind of like a little domed black Allen mm -hmm. bolt, you know? So I just took that and I, I just put a little nut on the other side. Cause I had a bunch of these 440 nuts. That's a good idea. And, you know, Right. But anyway, so this came out okay. You know, it's got jacks on the top, mm -hmm. you know, and I had a bunch of these like flying saucer knobs. So I, I, I like those. those on there. Yeah. These are good looking knobs. Yeah. Right. So I have a question about that, um, that led switch. Um, yeah. Uh, if you were playing that on a dark stage, do you feel like the, um, the led would be less blinding than a standard led that's shining up at your eyeballs? Uh, yeah, I feel like these are not very bright. Like I'll show you here. I'll turn it on like that. Oh yeah. That's that not isn't very bright. bright. Um, right. I guess it depends on, you know, it's like if you, if you're playing with stage lights shining down on your gear or I don't know, I mean, like I have, um, the carbon copy, um, yeah. delay pedal and the lights on that, the LEDs are so bright that I can't even look at the pedal. Yeah. Oh, I know, you know, I I put one of those blue LEDs on this thing. I like these two LEDs are blue and they're just like blinding. Like actually I'm not super happy with them. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they'd like, if you had a hard time seeing it you would see these. So like, there'd be no mistaking when this is on. And so it doesn't really bother me normally because if I'm standing up you know, not staring at the pedal, like I'm not really seeing it, but if you're looking at it, you can't miss it. Cause it's just like, it's just like a laser beam, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a fan of that. I, I, um, I feel like I, it would blind me and then I wouldn't be able to see, you know, where I am. Yeah. That. You know, I think there's a thing there, like you can balance the, LED resistor. So usually mm -hmm. those LEDs for the on and off kind of thing, um, you know, bypass switch or whatever, it will have a, a resistor that, you know, limits the current to the LED. And usually like people use about like 1K or 3K, but you can go up to 10 or 20K depending on the LED. And the LEDs come in different varieties. So there's like super bright, you know, LEDs and they're like for the current, they're brighter. And then also the LEDs have like a, like a range of diffusion. So like how far, like what angle does the light go out? So some of them are super bright, but they're focused. Mm -hmm. so the light comes out mostly in the middle and others are less bright, but they will be more diffuse. So the light will go further out. I kind of prefer that mostly, mm -hmm. but I think like, you know, if you knew how bright your LEDs are, you could always put a different resistor in to, tone it down right you know and i think that that actually i probably should now that we talk about it i sure i could do that on this pedal and maybe that would help it out i just like had already boxed it up and i'm like okay that's really bright but i'll just leave it <laughs> you know yeah well i don't know maybe if if you're if you have really bright stage lights or something like that it'd be nice to have brighter leds just so you can be absolutely sure that it's on Oh yeah. Yeah. When I get the touring band together, you know, that pedal's coming with us. It's part of the stage gear. <laughs> right. Yeah. Cause you're, you're, you're not going to have uh, like a guy in the basement managing the effects while you're out on the catwalk. Shredding. Never, <laughs> never. Right. 
Yeah, I, uh, I started, I got this other thing. I had another one of these circuit boards for this parentheses fuzz. So I, I, I got this thing kind of boxed up. I got to wire it up in the interior here. It has like a lot of wires because there's like nine for each one of the switches, you know? So this one takes a lot of wiring. So I, I got this all boxed up and then I, um, I drilled two more enclosures. So this was the, was a doppelganger you know, clone, the love tone doppelganger. It's like a, like a fancy phase shifter. Mm -hmm. So I got this work in, but I bought three circuit boards when I did this one. So I, I start, I, after I got the first one working, I thought like, okay, I'll do the second, the other two, right? So here is, here's one of them. And then I got another box right here, right? So here's like another one. So I drilled these and kind of, you know, I fixed the holes so they're all the right size, you know? Um, so anyway, so I'm going to work on that. And then I got this other thing too. I kind of, I kind of got this, uh, this is like a, the DS one, but I'm putting it in this, this is like a boss DS one PCB, but I'm going to shoehorn it into this, this 125 B container. So I got this kind of started. That's white, isn't it? It's kind of a cream. Oh, okay. Actually, you know, it's kind of a nice color. I almost thought like I might just decorate this with a Sharpie. Yeah, and I had this weird idea that I would just draw the boss kind of markings on here. Like it would say DS1 and it would have the black like rectangle here with boss kind of inverted. Mm -hmm. And I just write really small tone, the level distortion. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to do that, but that's what I'm thinking right now. You know, but I'm, I'm, I, the, on the boss pedals, there's like a tiny PCB that holds the LED in place and it has a little screw and there's a little place where you can screw it in inside the case and this doesn't hmm. have it. So I took some crazy glue and I glued the little three millimeter LED in place. So I'm waiting for the glue to dry right now and then I'm gonna just stuff all this in the box, you know? So I did that just before we started the call today. You know? Okay, what other mods did you do to that one? You know, I didn't do any mods to that one. I think I'm going to mod it later. I'm okay. just going to put it all together and check that it's working. And then I'll, I'm going to do some mods. I found a PDF of mods. Maybe we'll put it in the, in the, um, in the show notes. Oh yeah. Um, there's a PDF over on DIYstompboxes.com. That's all a collection of mods for the DS1. And it's very comprehensive. So it goes through your basic DS1 circuit. It shows the schematic. It talks about the circuit. It shows the PCB. It shows, I'm using it to, to reference the diagram for this so I could know how to wire it up. So they show mm -hmm. this PCB and how to mod it, right? So so it's, it's pretty good. And then it has a bunch of mods. Some of the mods are by Keeley. So he has a few mods for the DS1. One's called like the seeing eye mod. And that's kind of, it's kind of got some internet fame, you know? Um, and there's a few other mods too. So it's got kind of a compilation of mods and you can kind of go through and read about each one, you know, and, and it shows how, how to wire it up. Okay, cool. Um, Some of the mods are about changing the op amp to a different one. And these use a, like kind of a weird op amp. I don't know if you can see it here, but let me see if I can show it. It's hard to see here, but like this chip right here, it's kind of long and rectangular. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like your standard op amp, you know, right? This thing right here. And that's actually a dual op amp, but all the pins are in one line. So it's got like eight pins in a line instead of two rows in a little rectangle. So they, they kind of have a little in that mod thing, there's a little PCB kind of layout. So you can make a PCB that converts this to a regular eight pin dip. Right. I'm not going to do that. Yeah, it seems like a lot of work. And you don't know what result that would have sonically, right? Yeah, maybe I might do it. I don't know. But I, I feel like <laughs> I feel like like the DS1 is so distorted. I'm not sure that changing the op amp is gonna make that big a difference to make it worth the effort. I think like most of the other mods are changing the caps and a few resistor values and changing the clipping diode i feel like that stuff's going to be very noticeable so i was going to go into those mods 
you know um then again like who am i like kiwi made a whole business out of selling effects so he obviously knows what he's doing if maybe if he's changing i don't know if actually if his mod changes that dip or if that's or that that op amp or if it's somebody else's mod but i don't know we'll, we'll see like i just got to get it working first i made another one of these and it was working so then i thought i'm going to build this one up and then the second stage will be to mod them and then i'll have two of them so i can do them side by side or i can do two different mods oh yeah you can do a video comparison yeah maybe yeah right actually you know steve vi he i saw an interview with him and he's like he was showing off his studio and his he's like yeah see i got this cabinet full of guitar effects and he's like yeah i think this is the first one i bought and it was a ds1 like he's like this is the first distortion pedal i bought and it was the ds1 you know yeah i've never had one um I don't oh know you don't why. have one i know i've never never bought a ds1 Oh, dude, I got to give you a DS1. I have like, I have like <laughs> so many right now. Oh, no, you need, you need to, you know, like, um, you need them for their, their enclosures. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, but I could give you one of these. I, I'm going to have three like this. So I got two that are going to be cream, and then one of them's in an orange enclosure, you know, but maybe I'll give you one of those when I get them all done. And you can mod it yourself and see what you think. Uh, I mean, that seems like a really great, platform for getting into pedal mods oh yeah yeah well you know i was on the diy stomp box forum just like yesterday and um there were a couple a couple posts about the ds1 so one guy was like hey how do i get my ds1 to sound more like a fuzz pedal hmm. right rather than a distortion pedal right and that was like a long thread it was about four pages and then there was another guy asking about the ds1 the seeing eye mod the keely mod he had found a a um uh, instructables page that showed how to do the mod and then it wasn't working so he was debugging and asking questions on the on the stomp box forum you know so it's it's definitely like out there you know i, th I think actually the ds1 doesn't sound too bad you know it doesn't sound it doesn't sound like you know it doesn't sound like a big muff but it sounds like a ds1 so like i don't know maybe like that would be a cool sound sometimes you know yeah well you know until you gave me that vulcan i i i guess i never really had a like standalone distortion pedal um like from the beginning of of time i've always gone for overdrive like i think my first overdrive was one of those dan electro like daddy-o or whatever you know those big horseshoe shaped pedals and that's that sounded great um to me at the time so then uh more recently i gave it away to somebody because i was like ah, i don't i don't like the sound anymore um but yeah, yeah distortion's uh, kind of a new frontier for me um yeah I, i'm hey. familiar with fuzz but yeah yeah well, you know, I think it's all good. You know, maybe maybe this week, if I if I if the song I think of is going to be fuzzy and distorted, maybe I'll try and record. Last week I recorded um, the different pickups, so I just I used the same good amp sound, but I I played through the three like bridge, middle, and neck pickups right for different sounds, and I mixed them. Maybe this I did add the big muff, so I also recorded the big muff. But maybe this week I'll play with a bunch of different distortion pedals. So I could do like the the big muff, I could do the Vulcan, I could do the um, DS1, and then mix those for a sound. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, right. It could be. It could be good. I think yeah. the guitars sounded pretty thick. Like I was actually liking the guitar sound I was getting when I mixed the different um, pickup sounds. Right. So that was pretty full sounding. I've only heard your song through my phone speakers, so I'll have to give it another another listen on proper speakers or headphones. It's on SoundCloud, man. Oh, it's on SoundCloud now. Yeah. We'll put, yeah, I'm I'll, on the internet, man. I'm live. I'll, I'll put a, a link in the description to your your song. Yeah. Right. And if I get mine finished, uh, when I get mine finished, I'll I'll put it up there as well on SoundCloud. Yeah. Nice. Right. So so anyway, so that could be a thing that we do next time. Maybe I'm going to do that. You know. Like I'll just try and mix the different distortion sounds. It depends. I got to think of a song first. So when I think of the song, then it'll give me the sounds that I need, right? You know. Right. So anyway, so that was that was what I did this week. Um, I ordered some more circuit boards. They're coming in the mail. I I had a couple of weeks ago. I'd gotten this these boards for this. Um, this is the twenty two sevenths, right? It's like the CMOS Big Muff. Mm -hmm. 
I think this is a great sounding Big Muff, but these boards were broken. There was a couple problems, like, you know, designer error. But so I, I fixed that and I ordered some new ones. So hopefully if I get these maybe uh, and they're working, I'll send you one and you can build it. Great. Yeah, I have to I have to buy a new soldering iron. Uh, oh, did you burn your soldering iron out? <laughs> no, no. But look at the tip. It's like. Oh, it's, yeah. Dude, you got to get a You got to get a good soldering iron. Because yeah. those cheap soldering irons, they just wear out. Yeah, I don't the, know if that was ever good. It might have been always pretty blunt. Well, when I got started, I always bought soldering irons at Radio Shack and they had cheap tips like that and the tip would wear out and then you could buy some replacement tips. But over time, it gets hot and and kind of, I don't know, kind of corroded. So it's really hard to get the, the tip off and then screw a new one on. Mm -hmm. And so then at that point, you got to throw the iron away and just buy a whole new iron. And they're cheap. They were like 10 bucks or something. But you know, I bought this um, soldering station and I probably paid like a hundred, maybe 150, maybe less. I don't know. It was about a hundred bucks, 125 maybe. And I've had it for like decades. Like I swear I've had the thing for like 10, 15 years now and it still works great, you know? And I haven't even had to replace the tip. I have one replacement tip and I, I haven't even used it yet. That's great. Yeah. yeah I, so I, well, I was looking well on uh, Amazon or eBay, because I don't, I don't use Amazon, but um, on either one of those, those, um, those places, you can find a soldering station for like 40 bucks. And um, oh, yeah. one of those was the top chosen in some article of like, you know, the, the best soldering stations that you can buy on Amazon. It was like 40 bucks. So well, if you're going to do it, I would, I would invest the 40 bucks totally mm -hmm. well spent. Right. So I would do that, you know? Yeah. 40 bucks is not even a lot of money. I mean, I think I paid like 15 or $18 for that one there. And that, I thought it was pretty great at the time because it was variable and. Um... It's like a dinner date. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but just think about this. If you got the soldering iron, you could have a date with your soldering iron, like, you know, any day. Right. 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 They're always going to be there. They're never going to flake out. You know, you're not going to come home and find them soldering with someone else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. right. Totally, totally good. 40 bucks. You yeah. know, yeah, I, I'm gonna, I would recommend it. I'm going to do that tomorrow. That's on my, on my list for tomorrow. Yeah. And other parts. I'm, I've got some, some other parts that I need to buy with the, the black Friday sales on before they before they expire yeah i think i'm gonna put this i think i'm gonna put this doppelganger up on reverb for sale and see if anybody buys it cool because i got the i got two more too so you know i always build like for some reason i always do three like i if i'm gonna build one board i'm like i buy three and then i build three of them okay <laughs> so so now i'm stuck with with extra circuits i gotta get rid of them you know? yeah well it subsidizes your your collection yeah, maybe, you know, it pays for the parts, you know, you know, so, um, and then I'm working on a thing for Steve too. Like I'm working on a circuit board for him. So, oh yeah. You're designing one for him. Yeah. And then he wanted to have two foot switches. Like I had the whole thing set up to fit in a small box. And then mm -hmm. he was like, well, can we do it with two foot switches? And then that just threw a whole wrench in my plan. So I'm going to, I'm going to work on that this week. That's I've been great that you're, that you're collaborating. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of fun. Yeah. We talked about it. I sent him some designs too. I was like, Oh, here's what it would look like. And then we had, he gave me some feedback and we kind of talked about changes, you know? Um, but the two foot switches on one box is totally different from one foot switch on one box. It's like big, it just, everything goes in different places now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you had like a, a regular size box with a foot switch on either end, it's still going to throw off your layout. But yeah. Right. So, so anyway, so I'm going to work on that. Um, usually I found my, my good productive time is in the morning. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I just get up in the morning and I, during the weekday, so it's like seven 30 or something. And then I work on that till like eight 30, have some breakfast and then I go to work at nine, you know, but I'm working yeah. at home. So that makes it super convenient. If I had to commute, it would cut into my, my time, but I'm like, my, commute, right. like my cute commute hour is now spent in the morning, just working on stuff, you know, which was great. Right. Yeah. I wake up at three 30 in the morning 
and then oh, I leave wow. at. Uh, oh, I'm up for about an hour, and then I go to work. So, um, so I don't think I can. I don't think I can do any like soldering at three thirty in the morning. But I could probably, you know, put some time into playing guitar. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I'd have a hard time soldering stuff up in the morning. <laughs> you know, that'd be really hard. But I could play guitar. I could do some music. You know. Yeah. I can sit on the computer though and, and hack together some circuit boards too. That's right. not hard to do, you know? Right. Right. Anyway, should we call it a day? Well, uh, actually, have you been listening to anything? Oh, uh, you know, um, I saw this movie about the band Sparks. Oh, yes. Who I had never heard of. They're like the biggest band you've never heard of. Mm -hmm. And then I found this documentary on Sparks and I watched it. It was actually pretty good. I would I've recommend heard. it. Watch the Sparks documentary. Yeah, I'd like to watch it. You, you said it was on Netflix? I think it was Netflix, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I heard that was good. And I I um uh, I was aware of Sparks, but I never really, you know, took the the dive. But uh, I uh, watched a couple of videos from uh, that I think are in the in the uh, the video in the movie. And uh, they're pretty great. I mean, they have such a unique sound. They they don't really seem like it's hard to imagine what their influence is on modern music, but they were like an early synth band. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And they're, I, I feel like their music was very original. So they're mm -hmm. not, they don't seem to follow in anybody else's footsteps. You know, they kind of have an original thing. And I think like they, like other people follow them. Mm -hmm. so you hear there the funny thing is that i've never heard of them but i've but when I, after seeing the movie like I'm, I'm recognizing the influence that they had on other bands you know like, like who would you say popular. that they've influenced oh i don't know a lot of people um like pet shop boys um okay you know uh like who else like any of those like english kind of synth kind of bands you know right I mean, the guy, the the one brother who sings, he has a very unique voice. I I I really can't think of anyone that he sounds like. That well, he he doesn't sound like any male vocalist that I can think of. Yeah, yeah, he's kind of he's kind of interesting. There, you have to see the movie. There, you meet them and they kind of they interview them and stuff. It's it's pretty cool. But they're, um, yeah, they were pretty unique. They were pretty strange, you know? And then, and then they put out like 25 albums or something, you know? I forget they did all these albums. You know, the funny thing is at the end of the movie, they talk about a concert they did recently. So in the 2010s, hmm. or 2015, okay. something like that, they did a, sh uh, a series of shows, right? In England, I guess they had a, they kind of sound like an English band, but they were actually from LA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right you know they're from LA right and they 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 fly to England at some point they they have a they they make a record Todd Rundgren uh, oh wow produces okay. their first album he sees somebody invites him and they're like Todd you got to go see Sparks right and so they they go to this like like factory or studio it was like a I don't even think it was a studio space I think it was like a place where they practice but they also had they made like dog beds <laughs> you know right and so todd goes there and they're just like it's just like they set up a show and it's just todd and his friend you know it's not like an audience right and they do their whole show as if there's an audience there right and todd's like okay you guys are 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 weird and unique i'm gonna i'm gonna produce you right so he produces an album and they're called half nelson at the time and then the half half nelson album flops right so something happens and then they fly them to England and they meet someone in England and that guy hears them and is like, oh, you know, I could produce this, right? So they produce an album and then they get this following in England, right? And they're really big over there and they make two albums, right? And then something happens and they have a third album and it kind of flops, you know, it isn't quite as big as they were hoping. It isn't, it wasn't bigger than their previous album. So they were like, oh, well, and then I don't know, like, I don't quite, didn't quite get it, but it sounded like they just decided, well, we're just going back to the States done. And then the, the English band was super disappointed because they're like, yeah, we were working with these guys. They were popular. People were coming to our shows. 
we're selling records and then the two main guys just leave and go back to the states you know hmm. you know they kind of have a cycle like that where they make an album they get some popularity and then they flop and then they get some popularity but then they but then you know years later they have 25 albums right but anyway they they go back to england in like 2015 or something and then they play like every night they play one of their albums oh wow so imagine doing you know, a, a series of concerts like for a month, right? And they're and every night you're playing a different album. <laughs> Is that crazy? That's crazy. Yeah, I mean that's um, that's uh, you know that's a talent to 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 hold that much music in your in your head. Yeah, they said that it was really hard. Like they interviewed some of the band members that played on that, and they were like, "Yeah, you know, we 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 practice." for four days and we get the first album down and everybody was feeling pretty good at it. And then, and then we play the second album. And then a few days later, you couldn't remember the first album again. You know? Right. But yeah, they, they, you know, it was, they also said it was kind of an epic experience. Like, Oh yeah. That, you know, they said I mean, it, it sounds like a, like a fun <laughs> challenge. Yeah. And stressful, but um, yeah, you know, I think they were kind of like maybe too ahead of their time. I don't know if it would have made a difference if they had come out at a, you know, if that music had come along at a later date, but um, they don't, yeah, they don't sound like anything from the time. Yeah. I'll, that I'll, I'll say out. that. I think that they were ahead of their time. You know, I yeah. think that a lot of bands like Duran Duran, you know, kind of could take influence from, from Sparks. Right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those bands that you heard, you know, um, they heard Sparks, right. Right years before and then they were like hmm you know like <laughs> you know but uh, but yeah it was pretty good i'd recommend that i i haven't heard their albums I'm, I'm tempted to buy an album and listen to it you know so maybe i'll do that this week that'll be my thing yeah that'd be good yeah yeah i i, I need to like kind of get more familiar with their their stuff but i, I i'm interested in seeing that movie um yeah i i just i had a couple days of I had one day where I got to listen to music for a few hours at work. And um, the one that, that kind of stood out to me that I thought was interesting is there's a um, uh, ambient uh, performer from Oakland, California called Sally Decker. And she has uh, an album called In the Tender Dream on, on Bandcamp. It seems very, well, it's very like, um, good early morning music mm, i'm gonna go look um, it up yeah very um very serene um depending on who you are or what you like uh, and then another one that i have to i have to call out that i um i didn't listen to this uh at work but uh johnny guitar watson um one of the guys i play music with uh, told me about johnny guitar watson um and i listened to some of that last night at the at the bar nice. um it was it was pretty good um there's some some uh, johnny guitar watson on on Bandcamp. um oh. i think it might be some remixes and stuff like that but uh, oh cool yeah i'm gonna go check that out and how can you not like a guy called johnny guitar watson i know i've heard the name but to be honest i i, I can't name any songs so i met might have heard some the name rings a bell but i can't i can't name anything so I'm going to, maybe I'll go in, investigate that this week. Okay, yeah, cool. Should we, yeah. should we call it a day? Yeah. Yeah. I think that was a pretty good discussion. We got into um, garage band a little bit and um, yeah. Um, we'll, 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 ha we'll have another song for next week. Yeah. Yeah. We got to do another song. We're going to keep doing this every week. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if, oh, go on. If, if you're watching this and you have it in you to, Put together a song this week send us a soundcloud link or something like that you know put it put it in the comments or make yeah. a video and put it in the uh, on youtube whatever but um yeah we'd be more than more than interested in, in hearing what you've got yeah we're going to do this every week through january and at the end of january we're going to play you have to play all your songs <laughs> <laughs> from every week <laughs> Yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Right? Well, it'd be a good little retrospective. It would be kind of funny, right? Yeah. 
anyway, so so that's really good. So we'll we'll see everybody next week. You know, um, I'll see you, Kirk. We'll 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 talk again. Definitely. Okay. All right. Thanks for watching. Yep. See you next time. Later.